And we're ready with the last block of the conference, which is lightning talks. We'll start with the first lightning talk by Jeremy White. Spoilers from XDC 2022. Jeremy, the stage is yours. Great, thank you. So I want to ask, do you guys remember when you could see people face to face? You could shake someone's hand. You could look someone in the eye when you told them just how bad their code was. Well, we're hoping that we get to do that all again a year from now. Obviously, we don't know what's going to happen between now and then, but we have made plans to be able to get together in person. Um, and so myself, my company, Code Weavers, and the Wine Project would like to invite you, the X development community, to join with us in a technical conference. So we, the Wine Project, have long admired the X development community. We depend on your work. We curse you under our breath, and we want to party with you in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the city of lakes. It's part of the twin cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis. And in my completely unbiased opinion, the best place to work, live, and go to a technical conference in the world, particularly in the fall. We will be meeting at the St. Thomas Opus College of Business in their conference facility that is in the heart of downtown Minneapolis with lots of restaurants and bars nearby. Uh, we'll all get to go on the... Uh, Large, world's largest private skyway and get hopelessly lost. Uh, it should be a great time. Um, and I want to take a moment to point out the dates, which are October 4th, 5th, and 6th, 2022. I want to give credit to Eric Heiler, whose idea this was, so it's his instigation, and to James Ramey, who actually did all of the legwork putting this together. So um, I'm just taking credit for their work, which is what CEOs do. Um, and there is a tiny little footnote. We are certainly very aware of COVID and we are preparing for it. We're allocating extra space so we can pivot as need be, but we're, we're really hoping that we can all be together and have a joyful time together in Minneapolis in a year. I hope to see you then. Okay, the next talk of today is going to be Jason Ekstrand and Bas Neuenhusen, who's going to talk about conclusions from BVH building with RedV and NV. So we had a talk to this morning for a couple of hours um, about the BVH building stuff that uh, we've got at Intel and whether or not we can reuse that for RADV. Um, the end takeaway is good news. It looks like code sharing is going to be possible with some caveats. Um, so one of the things that's unclear is exactly how command stream with control flow is going to work on AMD. Uh, Boss has some ideas about how that might work, but his ideas are currently untested and the documentation there is not real great. So if any of the AMD people could throw him some real docs, that'd be appreciated. Um, for some of the ALU stuff that we have to do, because there's uh, some calculations that have to happen on the GPU. On Intel, it's done in the command stream with ALU. RADV might have to kick off a compute shader. Um, Switching over to no for compiling grill files is looking likely, but details are very TBD. Um, and it looks like we're going to have to generalize some things a bit. So AMD does indeed have its own BVH format. This is not something that I knew going into the discussion. Um, and one of the big differences is that their BVH is a four array tree instead of the six array tree on Intel. So we're going to have to generalize some of the algorithms so they can work on six array to either size tree we might have to generalize some of the scratch space calculations, et cetera. Um, and clearly, AMD is going to have to have a different BVH generation backend. But the code is already fairly well set up for that because um, Intel's backend, Intel's BVH format is consumed directly by hardware. And we wanted to be able to change that in the future if we needed to. So it's already fairly well designed to be able to take different backends. Um, so it looks like it's possible, but there's a lot of investigation that still needs to happen. Um, the next big step is that somebody on my team needs to actually post what we have so that Boss can start playing with it. Because until he has something concrete to work with, it's a little bit harder to come to actual conclusions. Um, so I think that's basically where we left it. Uh, Boss, do you have anything to add? I, I guess the other thing is like obviously we need to figure out the co uh, command streamer stuff like that can happen in parallel, and then uh, hopefully that will especially when the girl code is posted, that will give us a good way to get to move forward. OK, I think that's all we had. Thank you very much. Up next is Carl Hebst with Rust in Mesa. 
Okay. Yeah, so I wanted to learn Rust a little bit, so I was trying to investigate how easy it would be to use it inside Mesa directly. Um, so my main goals here was just to learn Rust. Um, and I actually wanted to learn more about OpenCL specification, how that all works, because I was always, you know, looking into Clover and a lot of things were just, why does it look like that? And I wanted to actually understand by implementing OpenCL, uh, how that works out, like, why was it done this way? So um, to actually use it inside Misa, I had to figure out how to use Rust to implement a certain API. And I had to figure out how to, you know, be able to call into already existing Mesa code. Um, and another factor is like, because we are using MES, uh, Mason inside Mesa and we uh, don't, you know, can't just use cargo or something. Um, I had also to investigate how well that works and Dylan Baker was all uh, quite helpful with that and fixed a few issues or added support for bind gen um, to actually generate Rust bindings for stuff. So as I said, bind and bind gen is a tool to um, generate bindings. So you have a C header file or a lot of them. So you can just generate Rust bindings for that, which includes constants and function definitions and all that kind of stuff. And that's essentially it. So besides that, I just, you know, I just had to write some Rust code and I have a bunch where the code can be looked into if you really want to. Uh, it's a link in the PDF, so you don't have to copy or uh, copy it or something. Um, current status is um, I can actually do some OpenCL stuff with it already. So buffer, like reading from buffers, writing to them, copying them already works. Um, there's no compiler integration yet, which is something I'm a little bit scared of because we have LLVM and then near as well. And uh, without the, like, I suspect this can be quite complicated and there are also problems like um, static inline functions can't be used yet. And Near is using tons of those. So in order to use those, I actually have to, you know, write a library, which is just including the code and generate actual functions for that. So I have a um, object file with all those functions, which, you know, with static inline functions you normally don't have. And I can't use external crates to Mason yet. So this is a little bit annoying because um, Rust is easier if you don't have to take, for example, mutable references. And there are a lot of container libraries which give you, for example, a queue or vector or array or something. You don't have to take a mutable reference or to change them, like inserting elements or removing them. Yeah, that's it. Okay, and the next talk today is going to be Demi Obanur with summary of discussions from the multi-tenancy workshop. So the, sh the short answer for the multi-tenancy stuff is that it would be nice if more people showed up. The it Well, it turns out that there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of it, implementing it the way I'd hope I'd like to see it implemented is going to be a lot of work because it requires working. It requires a lot of, a lot of, it requires a lot of work. It requires in depending on how it's implemented, it could be as much as N times N for N devices and M OSs. Hopefully, I think it could be reduced to M plus M. But there's also, but still, having to create a whole different driver, low-level driver, in order to make it minimal enough for hostile multi-tenant use is going to be quite tricky. And also, there's the question of, does the hardware actually support this? Is the hardware robust, for instance, against instruction streams that try to bypass page tables to access memory that they should not be able to access. And that was, and that is really tricky, obviously, because 
I'm not a hard for one. I'm not a hardware expert, and apparent, and so that brings the question of, and so that's still an open question. Also, r- writing, actually writing this would require. I mean, obviously, it's a lot of work, but I still think it'd be worthwhile if it could somehow be implemented because the payoffs of secure of secure multi tenancy on commodity GPUs are enormous. Namely, basically not having to deal with regressions. Like, for instance, Cubes OS currently is, it looks like it may be suffering from reg- performance regressions because software rendering is being de-emphasized and reduced to fallback path. And that's really annoying. And so hopefully if, if hostile multi-tenancy and commodity GPUs were possible, then it would be really, really nice if that could be done. And it's the uh, libvf.io work it might also be helpful if that gets to a point where it's usable in on Zen or in a, for, in, for, for instance, and if it's attack service is sufficiently low, that means generally means having the emulation outside of the hardware domain. But yeah, it's it's a hard problem. And I'd still like to get more information, to somehow get more information about whether it can be done, what it would be involved, and so on. I guess the other, probably the the main the main top the main other. So basically, there's a lot of unresolved questions, and if there's some place to, some place that they could be discussed more long term, where there might be some like hardware people who know a lot about hardware who could answer some of them and so on. That'd be awesome. Okay, thank you very much then. Uh, so up next is Matthew Herb with the XR Security Bridge of Avatar Summary. Okay, so <clears throat> for this uh, workshop, uh, those are the topics that uh, I had in mind. Uh, mainly, uh, we need uh, more people to help and deal with the XR security issues. This was a bit of a failure because at the workshop we were uh, or at a maximum of five people during uh, the interactive session. I don't know how many people followed the session uh, remotely you know, using the CCC or YouTube, but this makes not many people uh, really wanting to participate. But we will we will try to fix that by also sending uh, an email for a uh, call to participate to the developers mailing list. Uh, we spent some time talking about uh, uh, ongoing security issues, uh, among other the, uh, the X11 socket uh, person in the middle issue that uh, Demi reported uh, one and a half uh, year ago, and for which we should really start to try to, to fix it and move forward, uh, testing the patches that uh, were submitted at that time. Uh, we also discussed about uh, some general ways to improve uh, X uh, the security by uh, implementing the XCB on the X server side or other ideas like also bringing some rust in the code that may attract uh, new people because uh, it's something that may be uh, interesting and, uh, and motivating for, for, for people who, who have not yet uh, uh, try uh, to study the, the X protocol. It, it may be a, a new way to attract uh, more energy there. We also discussed uh, a bit with uh, Benjamin uh, on, the, on the way that uh, private issues uh, on GitLab uh, may be used or not uh, to, to report issues. And currently, uh, the situation uh, uh, until the discussion, the, the situation was a bit unclear to me. Uh, now we have a, a bit more understanding and we will probably create a separate uh, project so that we can have uh, private uh, rep- repositories for the projects to, to actually test 
Nous sommes patches uh, before the, the, the security advisories go out and, uh, and the new and the fixed modules are released. And finally, we also discussed a bit about the fact that we need uh, more documentation. Uh, for instance, the, all the new stuff around Wayland, uh, I'm not sure if it's correctly documented somewhere, what are the security contacts, and if someone would uh, report a, a vulnerability in uh, LibWestern or, or LibWL routes to XR security, maybe we would uh, uh, suffer a bit and uh, struggle a bit to figure out who to forward this to. Uh, so we need to generally document the, the process uh, a bit more. And this can also be useful for uh, package maintainers who may get direct uh, reports about security issues if they don't know how to move forward, how to allocate a CD ID, how to, how to, how to do a, a, an advisory. We have some documentation existing. We just need to refresh it and uh, make it more visible on the XOR wiki or on a GitLab wiki. That's about it for what we discussed during this workshop. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Up next is Martin Rucala with notes from the CI workshop. Okay, so um, that's a quick summary from the workshop. Um, so we had two main topics, trace-based testing and then kernel testing in CI. So uh, let's start with the trace-based testing. Um, so one of the uh, important findings was that reviewing frames outputs was really hard. Uh, just looking at a single frame, uh, it's hard to notice if there are things missing, like heads or something like this, um, or just uh, general misrendering. Um, then the next thing was that the frame check uh, using checksums of frames um, works on some games on very simple um, outputs. But on modern games, it, it's becoming uh, well impossible. Then that so we were discussing about returning to uh, reference frames and then having uh, a way to overlay uh, and say basically at this particular pixel uh, we have seen that up to that much variance, and this way uh, if we were to ship the reference frames along with the traces, then we, we could easily check if the frame uh, that we just generated is valid or not. Then um, we also in investigating creating this reference frame for all the GPUs and GPU drivers. Um, so um, rather than, than saying, hey, it is OK if this, um, uh, for this particular GPU, only these pixels are going to change, but being more generic, actually, and being, uh, for instance, filtering if it is different on different GPUs, then it's acceptable because from a user point of view, uh, the pic most pixels don't really matter uh, if you're off by one or two on every component. So, um, so we'll try to make it somewhat general and just catch big changes and to catch issues that would be a bit less uh, uh, well, easy to catch, especially in places that change a lot, then we were talking about potentially looking into temporal stability of the frames uh, to avoid having uh, something that might look good in one frame, but actually is flickering a lot uh, between frames. And uh, we could catch some issues like this. And so quickly, this is, for instance, a frame that renders the same on all our GPUs. And that's a frame that doesn't. And if we look at where the changes are between the two, uh, between two images from the same, uh, with the same driver, um, then we see basically that anything around uh, geometry is, uh, is problematic, although here it's not too much geometry, but you can see that there are changes there. Then for the GitLab based kernel testing, um, developers can start using GitLab for their kernel trees, uh, but we cannot move yet DRM tip and DRM, DRM misc because that's too high traffic and too, um, well, we need to ramp up slowly, basically. So let's start with smaller projects like Nuvo and already started and uh, Predreno and um, some others can be added and hopefully they're gonna uh, uh, 
pave the way and, and uh, figure out what works and what doesn't. Code submission is uh, going to be difficult. It has to be somewhat of a hybrid model. Uh, we cannot have everyone sending merge requests in GitLab because, well, we cannot expect people outside of the community to, to you know, um, uh, connect to to our uh, GitLab instance and and follow things there. So the proposal was to have the core contributors uh, host the project on GitLab and use MRs to uh, to test their codes. Occasional contributors will send their patches through the mailing list as usual. And then because we want to make sure that people can, uh, outsiders can review the, um, the the changes, then we would set up uh, GitLab to send notification to the mailing list of the project. Uh, we also uh, decided that, uh, well, I mean, this was already decided before, but basically storing the GitLab CI.yaml file can be done in upstream. Uh, Daniel Vetter and Dave Ali were fine with this, so this is very good. That simplifies everything. And that is it. Okay, and we have one more talk of the day, and that is going to actually probably be me. Okay. So how we did the XR conference 2021 today. Uh, so this is how my setup looks like and uh, looks almost professional, but basically it's not as much as you think. Uh, the third screen would be very useful for the mainstreaming setup. The microphone is mounted on Faith. It's not really mounted on anything. It's just like standing there in the uh, shock mount. Uh, the second PC is absolutely required for monitoring the stream. And in terms of how everything is set up, this is roughly how we did it. Uh, we had two primary setups. One was my box on Arch here and the backup box for Maciej Domotowski's home. Uh, both of these machines were just using OBS Studio for everything. Uh, and then we had two machines set up on Hetzner. One was uh, with the Jitsi instance where everyone connected to. The second was the Nginx box with Nginx RTMP uh, for wording. And that was pretty, pretty cheap because it cost us like five euros in total for the three days of the conference. And that forwarded both streams to YouTube and media.cc.de, which was absolutely amazing. Thank you very much for your support this year. It was wonderful. Uh, and in terms of how much uh, actual resources those boxes were using, we had about 100% CPU usage on the GTC box during workshops or with about 40 people on those and about 20% on the engines box. So we could make it even cheaper, but eh, it was fine. Okay, so now the part everyone's waiting for, the fuck ups. Surprisingly few though. Uh, so the primary streaming box had Arch installed, backup had Ubuntu and font configure free type configurations was mismatched. So OBS scenes gets, mis gets misaligned and we needed to fix that really, really quickly before the conference started. Uh, the RTMP gateway had engines with the RTMP module built from sources and then Ubuntu decided to upgrade itself overnight and that broke the setup about 10 minutes before we were supposed to go live, which was um, interesting. Uh, the backup setup was used for workshops, so we basically I thought that we could just enable the Jitsi recording in case we had to switch over the backup to the main talk recording, but uh, I tried the Jitsi recorder today and it turns out it does not work. So we pretty much went without a backup for two days straight. Great fun. Uh, and we also had a pretty nice uh, backup uh, placeholder, but we did not get to use it in, uh, even once. Uh, and aside from that, two small social issues. I forgot to lock YouTube comments on day one and that ended up just about as well as you think. We just had to swing the band hammer a little there and then trying to keep up and just pay attention to everything that's happening on the stream with the speakers and everything is a bit too much for like seven hours straight. It, there needs to be someone to swap out after a few hours. And you know, aside from that, you get stressed, you make more mistakes, those mistakes cause you more stress and then everything just devolves into slow, slow panic. The first day was hopefully not too bad, as long as you did not see what was happening behind the scenes. It was fine though. Okay, so we almost we did almost everything with free software. So free software, video editors, image editors, pretty much everything. 
The only exception was the NVIDIA encoder for the actual stream, because that's what I have in my box. Uh, if you want to check out the stream assets and the configuration and everything with it, it's on GitHub under this link. It will be updated with everything we made during the conference in two or three hours. And the videos are now being processed, so it will take a few days, but you can get either the live replaced now or the pre-processed and nicely cut up videos in, you know, a week or two. Okay, thank you very much. And that's it for the lightning talks. And now it's time for the closing session by Radoslav Schwichtenberg.